Um, I found out that uh, beer and liquor, what it did was uh, it took away the social anxiety from me. We were partying down on the, we're from Las, we're living in Las Vegas, so we're partying on the strip in Las Vegas. Uh, July 11th at 5.30 in the morning, uh, my wife rolls over to me in bed and says, Keith, I've got to go to the hospital. And I caught something out of the corner of my eye. So I turned to look. And as soon as I turned to look to my right, when I turned and saw this, I got this tremendous sense of just pure terror. So the demon proceeds to tell me that my wife is going to die in the hospital tonight and there's nothing I can do about it. The anger was so fierce coming off this demon. It was penetrating to the deepest part of my body. I am crying hysterically. My face is soaking wet from sweat. My shirt is drenched from sweat. And all of a sudden, I yelled out, Father God is real. Father God is real. And you know what happened when I yelled that out? The demon didn't go away. He got more angry. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. I'm so excited to bring Keith with us today. Keith has an incredible story. Just not too long ago, his wife lay ill in the hospital and he had an encounter with both good and evil. You don't want to miss this. So welcome with me today, Keith. Keith, thank you so much for being with me today. Hey, Julie, how you doing? Good to see you I'm again. Great. Good to see you. Well, I'm so excited to, for everybody to hear your powerful testimony. And a lot of this just recently happened. And so why don't you start today with maybe what led up to this and where you were at in life? Uh, growing up, I suffered from um, something called social anxiety. I'm not going to go into what that is. Uh, you guys can Google that if you want. Um, but it's 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 a basically in a nutshell, it's a tremendous shyness and fear of uh, speaking in public, um, fear of talking in front of people, uh, things like that. And that started about the time I was probably about uh, probably 11, 11, 12 years old. That started. I don't, I don't know what triggered it. Still don't to this day, and, and, and nor do I care to find out what triggered it. Because uh, it's not important, as you will see, uh, what happened to me with that. Um, so, you know, moving forward a, a little bit, um, as I grew older and older, um, I started, you know, I went to high school. Um, and in high school, I was a very good student in high school. I never smoked, drank in high school, never did any drugs in high school. I guess that was because I respected my parents too much uh, to. to to do that, to, to dive into that, because there was plenty of people in my high school who were doing that. Uh, but I guess I just chose not to. Uh, but then <laughs> I got to college and uh, that all ended the first night at college. Um, I found out that uh, beer and liquor, what it did was uh, it took away the social anxiety from me. Um, it seemed like when I drank, or it did, um, you know, certain drugs, it, it took away the social anxiety and I became like a normal person, um, which made me feel better about myself because the social anxiety disappeared. Uh, but anyway, so throughout college, I partied very hard, um, never graduated from college. Um, actually partied too hard where they never invited me back. <laughs> I was told not to come back. I wasn't invited back. They didn't want my money. Um, so uh, fast forwarding a little bit from there, uh, that continued the heavy partying continued uh, throughout my 20s, you know, my mid 20s, you know, my, my about from 20, from the time I got to college, which I guess was 19, uh, through about 26 years old, um, I continued partying very, very hard. Uh, we I met my wife in the Florida Keys, met her in a bar one night. Uh, she was partying hard too. Uh, so we we're basically partying six, seven nights a week, uh, all sorts of drinking. And I don't mean six beers. I mean, like, you know, 16 drinks a night, right? Waking up and throwing up in the morning and then going to work uh, where I worked uh, down there. 
on the Florida Keys. It was that type of partying. And that was, like I said, five, six nights a week uh, out to all hours in the morning. I think the bar closed down at about three or four a.m., uh, leave the bar, you know, whatever, between one and four, sleep for a couple hours, go to work. Um, you know, so that that's just the way we lived. Uh, we lived like that for a number of number of years. Uh, it's what I knew. It's what I did. <laughs> Looking back on it, I think, boy, that was awfully foolish. But you can't go back in time. 2013, uh, excuse me, 2010 ro rolls around. And um, I start looking into the world for some reason. Um, I started looking into politics. I started looking into various so-called conspiracy theories, things of this nature. And I found it all rather fascinating um, how there seemed to be another narrative of the world out there. Uh, May of 2013, like I said, it didn't take me that long. It probably took me about a year to discover that Jesus and God were real. So now we're in 2014. And from 2014, actually up until today, um, I have had my head in ancient history. I've had my head in the Bible. I've had my head in various um, uh, Bible teachers and things like this because I am completely fascinated by it and cannot get enough of it. Um, but here's the thing. As I was studying the Bible, I was still living. I was living as a hypocrite. OK, I knew what the Bible said. I knew what was written in there. I knew it was true, but I was still going out. I was still getting drunk. I was still getting high. Um, but my drug use seemed to just focus on, I got rid of um, any psychedelics I used to take and just switched completely to weed, pot, marijuana, whatever you want to call it. I switched to that, but I became an extremely heavy pot smoker. Uh, more pot smoking than drinking at this point in my life. Um, I was smoking pot from the time I got home from work um, until the time I went to bed on a continuous basis. So if I got home at four o'clock from work, I was firing up that bong at 4.30 after I got out of the shower to the time I went to bed at nine o'clock at night. I would pull hits off that bong every 20 minutes. Mm. If I got home at one o'clock in the afternoon, the same thing would take place. If I got home at seven at night, the same thing would take place. And the reason why I stopped drinking so much was because I found that when I smoked the pot, I was still able to study the Bible and the history and the conspiracies and everything else I wanted to study and take it all in and still be able to concentrate on it. I know it sounds strange, but that's how the weed affected my mind and my life. Um, okay, I know it sounds weird, but I was still able to do that. I didn't zone off on the couch. I didn't sit there and eat. I didn't play video games. I was immersed in this studying still. Um, you know, but we were still going to concerts. We were still getting drunk. We would go out to dinner, order a few bottles of wine, uh, have a big steak dinner, uh, drink the bottles of wine. And um, that was just how we lived. We were partying down on the, we're up from Las, we're living in Las Vegas. So we we're partying on the strip in Las Vegas. We were partying hard at Fremont Street. I remember we would go down to Fremont Street at noon, start drinking at noon. Uh, we would Uber down there and start drinking at noon and drink ourselves silly till six, seven, eight o'clock at night, sometimes till midnight. So 12 hours of drinking. Yeah. I look back now and just, I just shake my head, but it's how I lived, right? I can't take it back. Uh, so Keith, this all continued until what, July of last year, right? Tell us yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah, this all continued until um, July of last year. Um, I'll start on July 9th of 2023. Uh, July 9th of 2023, we went out for my wife's birthday uh, to a steakhouse here in town. And again, we had two bottles of wine along with a couple of glasses of wine uh, that night. And after dinner, we went gambling at the casino because we went to the steakhouse in the casino. And we gambled for a good uh, three, four hours. Uh, the roulette table. We were just gambling, partying, high-fiving people, drinking, doing whatever, living like we didn't have a care in the world. Uh, we went to bed that night. My wife got up on July 10th, wasn't feeling very good. And keep in mind, my wife has suffered from health problems for a number of years, diagnosed with IBS back in 2018. So we just figured it was another IBS flare-up on July 10th of 2023, uh, because that's what it felt like it was. Um, woke up, uh, so fast forward another day, uh, she wasn't feeling good on July 10th. 
uh, slept a lot during that day. It's feeling terrible. Uh, moving forward to the next day, which is July 11th, which was her birthday. Uh, July 11th at 530 in the morning, uh, my wife rolls over to me in bed and says, Keith, I've got to go to the hospital. I go, what do you mean you got to go to the hospital? Uh, this can't wait. We can't call. We can't call the doctor in a couple hours when the doctor's office opens up. She's like, no, I need to go to the hospital now. Now I know something was serious. We go downstairs and we just happen to pass by a hospital, you know, every day driving to, to our job sites. And so that's the hospital. It, it took our insurance. Uh, we didn't know anything about hospitals or where to go. So we just went there and we got there about 630 that morning. And uh, my wife got taken to the back. She was in a tremendous amount of pain was taken in the back and they gave her what's called a CT scan with um, a contrast. Uh, long story short, doctor comes out to me, my wife is still in the back. She goes, um, you know, sir, uh, your wife isn't going anywhere. Uh, we need to check her into the hospital. Uh, she has a um, apple core lesion that's wrapped around the inside of her colon that's this big. And we need to do two emergency surgeries in the next couple of days. Uh, I go home, I Google apple core lesion. Uh, apple core lesion is a malignant uh, cancerous tumor uh, that was wrapped around her colon. And um, oh, I'm sorry. And um, so we... Um, you know, she, she's in the hospital now, checks into her room. Uh, long story short, she has one surgery on July 13th. It was, yeah, it was July 13th. Uh, and then the other major surgery, which was a seven hour surgery, was on July 15th. Um, so that's the background of where I came from and what led up to the date of July 16th. Uh, which will move us into July 17th, which is when this uh, supernatural encounter I had in my bedroom. Um, July 16th rolls around. I'm going to the hospital, you know, those days from the 12th until the 16th, twice a day would go in the morning and I would go at night. Uh, July 16th rolls around. I go to the hospital and mind you, nothing odd went on during any of this time. Uh, nothing odd went on. The only thing that did happen was I wasn't smoking so much pot. Uh, the only time I was smoking pot um, was before bed. Uh, I would take about two or three bong hits before bed just to get to sleep because I've been doing it for a decade or more, you know, for hours and hours a day. Uh, so I didn't want to stop, you know, what you call cold turkey, right? But I needed to have a, a focus where if something happened to my wife, I could react like that, whether I had to rush to the hospital or do something, right? Um, so July 16th, I go to the hospital at night, uh, see my wife, uh, kiss her good night that night. I leave the hospital about 630 and I stopped off at our favorite sushi place. I went home. Um, I took the dog, ate my sushi, uh, took the dog out, um, came back in again, pulled those two or three bong hits and went up to bed. I guess I went up to bed at about um, nine o'clock. And I went up to bed at nine o'clock that night. Again, put the TV on because we would fall asleep to the TV every night and TV would stay on all night. Um, it was just how we fell asleep. And it was something I was probably watching Seinfeld or, you know, I was probably watching some other television show, right? A, a sitcom or something like that. And um, I don't know, I guess I fell asleep probably about... Um, I guess about 9.30, we go to bed early. <laughs> okay, we're not late people, we normally go to bed early. Um, so I fell asleep and um, keep this in mind, when I fell asleep, um, it was very, it's very hot in Las Vegas in the summer. Um, it was about, a, and it was all, it was tremendously hot this week. I remember it very vividly because in, in the daytime it was about 117 degrees. Um, so it was still about probably 105 degrees. So the air conditioning was on in the house. Uh, we had two fans running in the bedroom. The TV was on. Lights were off. I fall asleep. And then here's where it started. Um, I fell asleep. And at about 1220 in the morning, uh, which is now July 17th, 1220 a.m., July 17th, 2023, um, 
I was awoken out of my sleep. Um, I was laying on my left side. I was laying on my left side because that's how I fall, fell asleep at night. And I was awoken. I don't know if uh, something touched me or I just woke up because of the presence in the room. But I was awoken at about 1220 on July 17th, 1220 a.m. on July 17th. And when I was awoken, I picked up my head and I caught something out of the corner of my eye. So I turned to look. And as soon as I turned to look to my right, there was an extremely dark presence. Uh, it was very, very large. It wasn't like an apparition of a man standing there. Um, it was an extremely dark presence that was kind of like shaped like a giant uh, circular um, pattern. Um, and it was extremely dark. It was way darker than the rest of the room. Because remember, the TV was on. So, excuse me, the room had some light to it. Now, when I turned and saw this, I got this tremendous sense of just pure terror and the tremendous sense of pure evil. I could feel the sense of terror and evil emanating off this shape that was right here. Okay, the edge of the bed was here because when I rolled over, I rolled so the edge of the, my shoulder was almost on the edge of the bed and the presence was right here. It was literally about a foot away from me. And again, I don't know, how, I, I can't describe it any other way as just the essence of pure evil and terror. Now, at this point, um, I started hysterically crying because again, I was so, I was scared out of my mind. I knew this was evil. I could sense it. It was putting off this weird aura. And in the rest of the room, there was like this, it wasn't clear. There was like this mist, almost like a mist or vapor, but it wasn't like wet, right? It was just, it's just what I saw. Like the room was like almost like blurryish looking from like a mist or vapor. And it filled the room. Okay. So at this time, I am laying there in bed and I'm like frozen. Right. I, I find that I can't move. It was either I couldn't move or I was too terrified to move. I don't know which it was, and I still don't know to this day which it was. But I was on my back and I couldn't move. And all of a sudden, like I said, I'm, I'm now crying hysterically and I'm starting to sweat profusely. And I believe this was from the terror and the fear I was feeling inside of my soul. That's how terrifying this thing was. Um, it, I now know that it was a demon in the room. And a pastor at the church we started going to uh, helped me understand this way back in um, uh, August or September. Um, so I'm laying there. I'm completely terrified. And all of a sudden, the demon speaks to me. Now, it wasn't a voice like me and you would talk, um, Julie. Okay, it wasn't that type of voice. It wasn't like a voice we communicate with each other. It was more of like a telepathic voice. And the voice came from that dark, evil, evil, evil figure into me, if that makes any sense. It's hard to explain. Um, so the demon proceeds to tell me that. My wife is going to die in the hospital tonight, and there's nothing I can do about it. Now, when I'm told this, I'm already terrified and hysterically crying. Well, now I'm even more terrified because this, this creature, this, this demon is telling me my wife is going to die tonight in the hospital. There's nothing I can do about it. And what I thought there wasn't anything I could do about it, right? I'm in my bedroom. 
it's 12 20 in the morning or whatever time it is now 12 30 12 35 whatever time it is now and i can't do anything about it i'm frozen in my bed um so he proceeds to tell me this and at this same time as the demon is telling me is telling me this what i didn't know till later when my wife informed me what happened that night to her in the hospital the nurses came in and took blood at this same time as the demon is telling me this. The nurses go in the room to take blood from my wife because they took it a lot when she was in the hospital. They took it multiple times a day, multiple times a night to make sure an infection wasn't setting in from the major surgery. So they take the blood and they test the blood right there, right? They have a unit where they test the blood to see if there's an infection. Her white blood cells are rising. Well, it turns out at that same time as a demon is telling me this, they get the blood test results back. And sure enough, my wife is developing an infection in her body. Her white blood cells were starting to elevate. So right away, they put her on a strong IV antibiotic at the same time. I didn't know any of this was going on. Okay. So the demon goes and proceeds to tell me, again, your wife. Oh, I forgot this part. At the same time as my wife's getting her blood taken, at the same time as the demon is telling me my, he, she, it's going to kill my wife, there's an old lady screaming in one of the rooms in the hospital. Now, my wife was in an intensive care unit because they didn't have any beds at the time to put her in. So she had a private room. And the, room, the, 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 the hospital section of this, the, the section of this hospital is shaped as a horseshoe. And there were like three or four rooms and two or three rooms. And then it came back down, so it's shaped in a horseshoe. And my wife said at that time she was awoken by some woman screaming hysterically in her room uh, where it, where the nurses were rushing. They couldn't calm her down. My wife said it took about 25 minutes to calm this woman down, let alone this is a quiet hospital ward, right? Okay, this isn't a uh, sanitarium or anything like this, right? This is a quiet hospital room, intensive care. Anyway, they eventually got the lady calmed down. And I found that rather interesting that those two things were going on at the same time that Dean was telling me that she was going to, it was going to kill. Uh, so fast forward a little bit. So I'm yelling, no, my wife is not going to be killed tonight. She's not going to die. You're not going to do this. And I'm crying again. Remember, I'm crying hysterically. I'm sweating profusely, but I can't move. But I'm screaming back at the demon. My wife is not going to die tonight. Now, I didn't want to. I remember the demons right here so I could reach out and touched it. Right. But I was so terrified. I was thinking about maybe trying to hit it, but I'm like, Oh my God, what if it grabs me? You know, <laughs> all these thoughts are going through my head right in a split second. So again, I couldn't move. So I couldn't reach out to touch him, but I was thinking about doing it. Um, so fast forward a little bit, a couple minutes go by as I'm screaming and crying hysterically in my bedroom with this creature there. Um, now, all of a sudden, for some reason, the demon um, turned its focus away from my wife and now was focused solely on my life. I don't know why it did this, but it's focused solely on my life now. And it proceeds to tell me to go myself. And that I was worthless. Now, what I found out just very, very recently was that demons and satanic beings are not allowed to. They have to have you yourself. This is what I read just recently over the past month or two. Was that. And I put two and two together just recently, where that's why he was telling me to myself. And again, this is a telepathic voice coming from this app, this this demon here into me, telling me to kill myself because I am worthless. That I will kill myself, and my wife will be left alone to recover from cancer and her surgery. And there's nothing I can do about it. Just go yourself because you are worthless and no good and not worth to live any longer it was very specific it told me to grab one of my load it and with it 
Okay, so it's very, very specific. And I yelled out, I said, no, I am not going to kill myself. I have to live and I have to live for my wife. She could, will not be left alone to recover from this cancer. Remember, this is stage three. This is a serious cancer. This is stage 3B. Later, we found out this was not all cancer serious. I think you understand what I'm saying. It wasn't a polyp. It wasn't stage one. This is stage 3B. This is like a quarter of a step away from stage four. Okay, stage 3B cancer means it left the area and has gone to the lymph node. That's a whole nother story in itself uh, with all the miracles that happened in the hospital. Uh, but anyway, getting back, I digressed again, uh, getting back to, to, to the main point here. Um, so the demon proceeds to tell me to kill himself, but he must have said this three or four times. I'm yelling back again three or four times. I will not kill myself. My wife needs me, crying hysterically, sweating profusely. Um, then all of a sudden, for some reason, when it realized I wasn't going to kill myself, it turned to something else. Now, while I'm yelling, I'm not going to kill myself, I could sense that the demon was getting angry. And I could sense it throughout my body. And, and the room, believe it or not, was getting darker. The room was getting darker. The air was getting heavier. And the mist type look was getting more pronounced, if you can imagine this. It's getting darker and heavier. And the apparition, because that's the only word I need to say it, this demon here was actually getting darker. And I could sense the anger and hostility coming off of it even more as I'm yelling, I will not kill myself. It then proceeds to say, these are the words it said, okay? Better yet, I am going to kill you with a heart attack tonight. Wow. At this moment, my chest starts to tighten. I can physically feel, I was not imagining this, I felt my entire chest and my entire abdomen cavity constrict. And it said, do you feel that? Do you feel your chest tightening? Again, telepathically, it's selling this to me. Now, now the people who have I've told this story to, and I've only told this to a few people, and I've only publicly told it once at my church. And the people always ask me, what did the voice of the demon sound like? And I'm going to tell you this now. It wasn't growling. It wasn't you know, it wasn't, ah, this is what you're happening. You're like, you see in horror movies. Okay. It just had a regular voice and believe it or not, the voice, um, for was very matter of fact, like it was matter of fact, but it wasn't yelling, but it was a matter of fact voice. I don't know how else to put it, but that's what it sounded like coming into me. Like this is going to happen. It's going to happen now. This is what's going to happen. Just like that. It's going to happen now. But no growling, no yelling. It was just firm and intense. So he says, like I said, it says, can you feel your chest tightening? You feel that? Guys, <laughs> my chest was tightening. As my chest is tightening, in my mind, a movie starts to play in my mind. And the movie started, it was a movie of my, it was a movie of my life from about the time I was, I don't really, I want to say, I keep on, I'd say, you know, 10 or 11 years old, let's just call it that 10 or 11. It wasn't when I was a baby. It was about when I was 10 or 11 years old, which might be, that's about the time you start to recognize things in life. Okay. And start to re have very vivid memories of life right? What took place, what's starting to take place. And I believe that's why it started about 11 or 12 years old. Anyway, the movie plays through my head and I don't know if it played for two minutes, five minutes or 10 seconds. 
right? I've got no concept of time at this point. Plays through my head, and it plays through my head, again, from the time of 11, 12, or 13 years old, all the good times, all the bad times, all the celebrations, all the birthday parties, all the high moments in my family's life, all the low moments in my family's life, all the high moments in my life, and all the low moments in my life. And that movie played up until that point of me laying in the bed that night. After the movie played in my head, um, my chest continued to tighten up even more. And um, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my God, I am going to die tonight. Guys, these are the thoughts that are running through my head after the movie played. I am going to die tonight as my chest is tightening. Then all of a sudden, I don't know what triggered it, but I yelled out, I am not going to die tonight. You are not going to take my life tonight. I am going to live because my wife needs me to live. And I am screaming this at the top of my lungs. I probably woke up the neighbors. That's how loud I was yelling. As soon as I said, I'm not going to die tonight, that presence in the room, believe it or not, got even darker and heavier and more angry. The anger was so fierce coming off this demon. It was penetrating to the deepest part of my body. I don't know how else to put it. It was penetrating every cell in my body, it felt like. Continue, I must have yelled that five or six times. And every time I yelled it, it got angrier and darkened the room more. And again, that figure right here darkened to almost a... Now it was almost like a dark, deep, purplish black. It was so black. I've never seen anything so black. If you look at something black on your shelf or something black like a bookcase, it was darker black than that. Never seen this black color before in my entire life. And I'm looking at a set of black speakers right here. It was darker than that. There's, it was a color that does not exist. That box of 64, 128 Crayola crayons with the black times that black by 100. That's how black this figure got. The room itself, remember the TV is on. The room itself was as black as that black crayon. That was the contrast I was seeing. No, it's hard to picture, but try to picture it. All of a sudden, I don't know what happened. But after I was yelling, I'm not going to die, I was released from the hold that my body was on. I was released, and I was able to roll away from the demon over to my left, and I sat up and put my hand behind me, and I was able to sit up in the bed. And again, I am crying hysterically. My face is soaking wet from sweat. My shirt is drenched from sweat. And I have tears. Guys, I have never cried this hard in my entire life. Take somebody, a death in the family, and times that by 10. I was crying uncontrollably from the sheer terror and fear. Mm. Hysterical. Pouring sweat, drenched in sweat. I was able to roll over, put my hand up, and all of a sudden, I yelled out, Father God is real. Father God is real. And you know what happened when I yelled that out? The demon didn't go away. He got more angry. I could sense it. I, again, I could feel it inside of my body. 
I could sense the anger. The anger was now emanating. You, it's hard to explain this stuff, but I'll try my best. I could see, because now I'm about, I'm about probably three feet away from the demon. And in between me and the demon, it almost looked like a mirage. You know the mirage that you can see? If, if, well, we live in Las Vegas, and sometimes the heat is so intense, you can see the mirage. Uh, if you look at it, you've heard of a mirage before where the kind of looks, the air kind of looks fouled up, for lack of a better term. Um, and that was the anger that was emanating from this, this demon here. It looked like a mirage between me and him. I must have yelled out, Father God is real, Father God is real. I must have yelled that out oh, know, four, five, six times. Nothing happened. It just got angrier. The room got darker. If it could get any darker, it did. It got so dark, guys. It got so dark and terrifying. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting chills. All of a sudden, I don't know why I yelled this out, but I guess I was just desperate. <laughs> I yelled out, Jesus is real. Jesus is real. He is Father God in the flesh who walked this earth. Guys, as soon as I yelled out the name Jesus, that demon vanished. It vanished from my bedroom. The room, the darkness in the room completely left the room. I don't know where it went. And it didn't leave gradually. It vanished instantly. Like in the snap of a finger. Mind you. I am still hysterically oh, crying and sweating profusely. All of a sudden, excuse me, as soon as the demon vanished, the mist vanished, the mirage vanished here, the darkness from the room vanished, and all of a sudden, a warm, Tough to say. I want to. I, 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 it's, I, the best way I can describe it is a white light, but a warm white light, not a bright white light, but a warm white light entered my bedroom. Enters not the right word. It filled my bedroom. It was engulfing my entire bedroom in a warm white light now this warm and it wasn't a beam okay it wasn't a beam of light it was a presence of a warm white light and the white light the presence in my bedroom was putting off <laughs> Julie, can we say, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I understand completely. Okay, go ahead and just whenever you're ready. Yep. Okay, so the warm white light presence in my bedroom was putting off just a pure sense of love. And that's why I can describe it as peacefulness. It was like a love and peacefulness. I had never, ever in my entire life felt before. And guys, I had not felt peace in a long time in my life. I was a very bitter and angry person. I was so angry and bitter that if somebody cut me off on the road while driving, I would immediately flip them off, curse them, and curse their family to die. That's how angry and bitter I was. So this light that came in my bedroom was the exact opposite of how I was living every day 
And it was the exact opposite of the presence, the demon, demonic demon presence that was in my bedroom just 30 seconds before. Now, about this time, I believe it was about 1.45 in the morning. So that demonic presence in my bedroom was there from 12.20 a.m. to about 1.45 a.m. in the morning. About an hour and a half, it tormented me with tremendous torment, fear, and terror. Now, as the light was there, like I said, the pure sense of love, forgiveness, it's so hard to explain, but that's what it was. At this point, again, I'm still crying hysterically, sweating profusely. I get up onto my knees and I just start yelling out. Remember, I am screaming. I am not speaking loudly. I am screaming. And I start to scream, oh, my God, Jesus, I repent. I repent for everything I've done. Please forgive me. I repent. And I started to name off multiple, multiple things that I won't get into here. But I started naming off multiple, multiple things that I should repent from. Obviously, some of the things were smoking pot, doing the drugs, partying out of control, um, being mean, terrible to people, just living a disgusting, just living a disgusting life. I don't know how else to put it. It was just disgusting that I look back on it. And I thought it was okay. Just scary. But I'm screaming out, I repent. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Now. At this moment, the light is getting even stronger in the room. The white presence, the light, the warm light is now emanating complete forgiveness, complete love. Like it was like telling me it's okay. Right? You just repented for it. And you really meant it. That's the sense I was getting. Pure love. Can't describe, don't know how else to describe it, but pure love. So at this point, the room got dead quiet. Now remember, the fans are on in the room. The TV is on in the room. It is now dead quiet and completely peaceful. The exact opposite of chaos and terror. I calm down. Collect my thoughts. I stopped sweating. I stopped crying. And I am told by this white light presence, which was God in my room, God was in my room as a white light. It couldn't have been anything else. It was God in my room. It tells me to grab my, he tells me to grab my telephone, which was on the end table because I had it there in case an emergency at the hospital happened. I grabbed my telephone. And uh, he proceeds to tell me to grab my phone and I went to video what was happening because now my thoughts are collected. I'm starting to come to realize what's happening here. And I went to videotape what was happening because I started saying to myself, oh, my God, nobody's going to believe this. I have to start videotaping this. So I start to I go to videotape it and God tells me no video. Only write what I'm going to tell you. And he proceeds to tell me, and I, and I have to um, read this verbatim. Uh, he proceeds to tell me that um, this was. Let, let, let me backtrack a little bit. Can I ask you a question about his voice? Sure. So I know you explained the demon's voice and what it sounded like telepathically. Was this similar God's voice in, into no. your mind? Okay. No, this was not a firm voice. This was a loving, caring voice. Again, this voice wasn't audible either. It was coming from, emanating from my atmosphere room into me. And it was the most calm, loving voice, indescribable. Never heard a voice like this ever in my entire life, not coming from anybody ever. 
I don't know. That's the only way I can explain it, Julie, is that way. The most loving, calm, soothing voice, not a wimpy voice. Okay, but a loving, kind, soothing voice. Now, let me just backtrack a second here because I forgot something very, very important. Um, at this time, as I'm yelling, I'm repenting, uh, and I can sense the sense of forgiveness that was taking place. I then yelled out, I said, Jesus, please take this social anxiety out of my body. Is, I've suffered with this for my entire life. I cannot deal with it anymore. Take it out of my body. Then I yelled, Jesus, what is my purpose in life? Because all throughout the years, I don't know if I mentioned this before in the beginning, um, but all throughout this in my life, I had been questioning since about 2013, what is my purpose here? What is this life all about? Life has to be more than going from getting up in the morning, going to work, coming home, eating, watching TV and going to bed and maybe going to a concert and a sporting event and spending time with your family, right? And your friends. I was thinking about this a lot over the past uh, decade or so since 2013, but recently in the past few years, like the past one and a half or two years, I've been thinking about it a lot where me and my wife would actually sit down and ask, you know, what's the purpose to this life? What is going on here? There has to be more than this, right? This can't be it. So I proceeded to yell out, Jesus, what is my purpose in this life? What is my purpose? I can't take this anymore. There has to be more to this. God proceeds to tell me my purpose in life is to start up a, a ministry called Victorious Ministry and preach the gospel to the world. This is what he tells me. Now, before that, I never thought of this. I am the least likely person in the entire world. Remember, I was terrified of public speaking before this happened. I could barely even speak a reading at my brother's wedding without garbling and mumbling my words. And, you know, so it happens with social anxiety. You can't speak in public. It's very difficult to. Um, so I yelled that out and he told me that I was going to start this ministry and he was going to uh, guide me in it. And that was my purpose in this life was that. Still kind of shocked by it today. Anyway, uh, as I said, the, the room then uh, went dead silent. And he told me to grab my phone and um, write this out. And he told me to write out. Your life has changed tonight. This was your wake up call tonight. Time to grow up. And he also told me to write down a couple of other things, such as what took place over the past couple of days in my wife's hotel uh, hotel room, my wife's hospital room. And um, I guess because so I wouldn't forget what took place because we prayed for the first time together ever in our hospital room. Mm. I was reluctant to do it because I was afraid someone was going to see us praying in our hospital room. Remember, I still had that social anxiety, but something made me get up out of the chair in the hospital room before a major surgery. I grabbed her hand and we prayed together. Mm. And we prayed together for the first time. So he told me to write that stuff down amongst some other stuff. Uh, then he told me to get up out of the bed and go downstairs. So I let the dog out of her crate because the dog loves to sleep in a crate, believe it or not. So I know it's weird, <laughs> but the dog loves to sleep in a crate. It's like her room or something, right? Um, so me and the dog go downstairs and I get to the kitchen and the kitchen is dead quiet. The guys, go in your kitchen at about, you know, 1.45, 2 o'clock in the morning, whatever it was at this point. I don't have any sense of time at this point. The last time I know was about 1.45 before I left the bedroom. And I left the bedroom a couple minutes after that. Um, so I'm downstairs. It's dead quiet. I don't hear any refrigerator running. The fan is on in the family room. I don't hear the fan running. It's dead quiet. And um, I um, 
get down there and I grab my phone. And um, God tells me as I grab my phone, you know, I have my, excuse me, I have my phone in my hand and he tells me to go ahead and write, type in my phone in the notes section again, open up the notes section again and write in the phone what I'm about to tell you. Again, I try to video it. He says no video. Anything that takes place tonight, when you tell people or if they ask about it, they will understand and believe you if they have ears to hear and eyes to see. Those were his exact words, what he told me. That's no video. Yeah. So I proceed to start typing what he's telling me. And the words are flowing through from out here. The words are flowing through my body and out my mouth. And I am speaking the words that he is telling me to type out my mouth in an audible voice. Now, this voice, I know this sounds strange. This voice was not my voice. It was a calmer, more gentle voice. Best way I can describe it and how I normally am and how I normally talk. I, am proceed, I proceed to type out what I was given. And the gist of it is, he gave me the mission in my life again. He told me the mission in my life is to preach the gospel to the world with this ministry. And it was going to be called Victorious Ministry. Again, I never thought about this in my entire life. Ever, 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 ever. He proceeds to tell me I will be preaching the gospel to the world. And again, he says, if they have ears to hear and eyes to see, they will understand. I hope I have gotten your attention now. That's what this voice tells me. Now, when I'm typing, I am typing this out. And I just have a regular iPhone, right? This isn't done on an iPad, anything like that. When I'm typing, there are no mistakes being made. There's no mispunctuation marks. There's no going back and erasing some letters because of a mistake. The typing was perfect. And you guys know how hard it is to type on a phone. Grab your phone and try and type at a speed. But this is how fast I was typing. Like this. That fast. Not one mistake was made. Not one. So after he said that, I hope I have your attention now. Me standing there in the kitchen, I close out that set of notes. I've got everything time stamped in my phone, which I can show to the screen after this is done with all the time stamps. So, you know, you know, this is what really happened. Uh, me standing there is still my arrogant self, probably. Right. I still got this kind of arrogance to me and this weird social anxiety thing going on right uh, in my head. Um, what I think is still there. I proceed to say to God, God, I need an another sign that this is real and this is you. He proceeds to tell me, little old me, right? I'm questioning God in my kitchen, right? He proceeds to tell me to walk outside. I put the phone on the counter. I take the dog outside. Now, my dog is a lunatic dog. As soon as you let the dog outside, this dog takes off and just laps around the yard, grabs a rope and runs around like crazy. I walk outside as I'm walking out the, at, at the back door. God proceeds to tell me when I get outside, go to the middle of the lawn and look up. I get outside. As soon as I hit the lawn with my foot, the dog freezes. The dog is now looking like a statue in my backyard. It is frozen in a seated position like this, staring off into space straight ahead. Not moving a muscle, not eyes are not blinking, ears are not moving. It's like a statue, like the dog transformed into a statue. I know it sounds crazy. I can just tell you what happened. I proceed to look up, and I look up to my backyard where the moon is. And around the moon, there must have been thousands, tens of thousands of stars. Now, guys, if you're ever in Las Vegas, I don't live in the boonies of Nevada. I live in Las Vegas, okay, in the city limits of Las Vegas. If you look up in the sky in any night, I don't care what night it is, 
you will see about three or four stars. If you're lucky, you'll see the Big Dipper. Okay. There was thousands and tens of thousands of stars surrounding the moon. I said, oh my God, what is happening here? This is unreal. Now I'm really freaked out if I wasn't freaked out enough before. I go, I go, oh my God, I've got to go inside, get my phone and film this. I need to video this. God proceeds to tell me again. Now, this is the third or fourth time. You're not videoing anything. You're only writing down what I tell you to write. If they have ears to hear and eyes to see, they will understand. I turn and look at the dog. The dog is still frozen. I walk over to the dog and I look at the dog. And I know this sounds crazy. This is just what I did. I can just tell you what happened. It's up to you to understand. I look down at the dog. <laughs> I say to the dog, oh, my God, Jesus is real. You know, Jesus is real. I said, all animals know. I said, the only creatures that don't know are people. Mm -hmm. That Jesus is real. At that point, as soon as I said that, the dog snapped out of its statue-like state, took off, grabbed its rope, and ran around like a maniac. I am then told to go back inside. I go back inside. He's proceeded to tell me to go back inside. I've got more for you to write down. Grab your phone when you get back inside. Now, as I enter the kitchen area again from the back door, I have no sense of time. I don't know what time it is. I, I don't know what day it is. I guess I wasn't even thinking about time, excuse me, or day or anything like that. I proceed to go over, grab my phone, and I proceed to type out um, some more stuff he told me to write. And this time it had to pertain to what was going to happen with our current business and some other stuff um, that was written down in the phone um, that I, I want to read verbatim, Julie, what he told me to write down, if you don't mind, uh, because sure. this is actually a quote uh, that I actually pulled off my phone, but I have to read it exactly because I don't want to misquote what was said to me. That would be disrespectful to God. He proceeds to tell me this, to write this down. He says, Father God is love. Satan is hate. Come out of the beast system. You cannot have it both ways. You can't go get drunk and high, revel with people in debauchery, and live a godly life. When you desire things of this world, you worship Satan, and he is evil, and will put terrible things on you and spite you just for laughs. You cannot go to church on Sunday, then get drunk and high on Monday. Father God doesn't punish you. Father God brings you healing. Satan brings you punishment because it is fun for him. End quote. He must have said, uh, after he said this, and after I wrote that down in my phone, he proceeds to say, Again, this is, quote, it is, it's complete, it's finished, it's done. He said this three or four times. It's complete, it's finished, it's done. What do I go and do? I start trying to type more. You know what happened? Nothing. I was typing on my phone. Nothing was showing up on the screen. Said it again, it's complete, it's finished, it's done. I took his word this time because after that, that freaked me out even more. I hit the enter button and I closed out the note section on my phone. When I closed out the note section on my phone to go back to the home screen of the phone, the time on my phone read, this is very, very important. The time on my phone read 2.22 a.m. in the morning. <sighs> 
222 was the room number of the hospital room my wife was in. She was in that room from the time she got put in the room until the time she left the hospital for 10 days. She was in that room, 222. And that's what the time read on my phone. At this point, I took the phone, I threw it on the counter, and I stepped back because it was just too much. It was too much. I was then told to grab the phone, go back to it, and place it perfectly center on the tile on the counter and leave it there. I was then told to go upstairs and get some rest because I've got a giant job ahead of me in my future starting that morning, the next morning. I walk upstairs. I get to the bedroom. The TV is off. The fans are off. Remember, they were all on when I left. There was no sleep timer set on the TV. There was no timer set on the fans. It was all turned off, and the room was cool. Remember, guys, it was 105 out in Las Vegas. The room was cool. I remember very vividly how cool it was. I proceeded to get in the bed. I told myself I'm going to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, I didn't know what to do. I was going to call somebody at this point, but I was like, who am I going to call? Nobody's going to believe this. I thought about calling my parents, right? The first person I thought of calling was my mom and my dad. I said, that'd be crazy. They're going to think you're crazy. I have to be checked in an insane asylum or something. If you call at, you know, 2, 2 30 in the morning, you know, 2.25 in the morning, whatever time I get upstairs, it was a couple minutes after 2.22 a.m. So I decided not to call anybody. I laid down, so I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. and start my day. I laid down, closed my eyes, fell asleep instantly. Don't even remember falling asleep. I just remember shutting my eyes, and that was it. I was out. I woke up at 6 o'clock on the dot with no alarm set. Went downstairs, freaked out, thought it was a dream, thought it didn't take place. But I knew if that phone was on the counter, it was real. I knew if the timestamps were in the phone for the notes, it was real and really happened. I went downstairs. I looked at the phone. Sure enough, it was on the counter, perfectly centered in the middle. It was almost like it was done by geometry. Like I took a, a ruler, measured out the counter. That's how perfectly it was placed. And not only was it perfectly placed on the entire counter, but it was perfectly placed in the tile, centered perfectly. I decided not to touch it. Had my cup of coffee, took the dog out, came back in. It's now probably 7.30 or so, 7 o'clock. Don't know what time it was about then. I decided to go over the phone. I um, opened up the phone, and I knew, again, if those notes were in there, I opened up the phone of notes. Guys, all the notes were in the phone with the timestamps. Looked at, saw everything was there, knew it was real. Fast forwarding here. Since that day, guys, uh, I, went, I went to the hospital that morning, told my wife what happened, and then didn't tell anybody for about a month, uh, didn't tell anybody, but a pastor at the church we started going to. Anyway, since that time, my life has changed drastically. I'm no longer angry or bitter. I'm no longer hateful. I am full of love, compassion, forgiveness, mercy, and kindness towards people. Keith, the miracles did not stop there. Tell us one of the biggest miracles of all with this. Yeah, the, the biggest miracle that has happened um, is that, as I mentioned, my wife had stage three, uh, stage three B colon cancer. Um, since she was diagnosed with that, had the two surgeries, um, we found a church that believes in healing. Um, we didn't know about healing uh, be before that, even though I studied the Bible and read the Bible. I just, I just glossed over. I must have just glossed over. It didn't even occur to me that God still heals today and God still performs miracles today on people's lives. Uh, but since that time period, um, back in September, 
um, we were going to the church that we found that believes in healing and all the miracles of God that still take place today, which they do. Anyone who doesn't believe that, I don't know what to tell you, uh, but it's all true. Uh, we went there and I had um, I obviously laid my hands on my wife and prayed for her for the cancer to be healed. And um, then we took her to a healing service at the church. Uh, the healing service at the church just happened to take place uh, the week after <laughs> we started attending the church. Uh, so long story short, we went to our church. Uh, at the end of it, they have called people up to the altar uh, for healing. Uh, the pastor there laid hands on my wife. Uh, my wife said that when the pastor laid hands on her, uh, my wife felt a tremendous amount of heat on, and a tremendous amount of heat went from her head down through her body and out through her feet and left her body. At that point, when it left her body, she went down to the ground, literally just collapsed onto the ground and laid there for about a good five minutes. Um, we went to the doctors um, after that. I remember all of her blood work was way out of whack, okay, from the cancer. And, um, and, and she did actually two rounds of chemotherapy out of 12 because uh, we stopped the chemotherapy because we both thought that God did not want her to do the chemotherapy after two rounds and going through 12 of them. Uh, and I felt like after the second round that it was going to kill her. I thought the chemotherapy was going to kill her. And my wife came up to me a couple of days after I determined that and said, I'm done with the chemotherapy. It's going to kill me. So we stopped that cold, went to the doctors. The doctor pulled blood. And believe it or not, when a, when a colleagist pulls blood, um, you have they can order cancer markers in your blood that get pulled. Uh, the blood test before that, the cancer markers were off the chart. They were way in the red. Uh, all the blood was basically, uh, most of it, I shouldn't say all, most of it was in the red. There was some green, but most of it was in the red. Um, we got the blood test back from the oncologist and the blood test, <laughs> praise God, all the glory goes to God. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you so much for this, Jesus. All the blood work came back perfect. The blood work was all in the green. The cancer marker was back in the green and not just a little bit back in the green, about three quarters of a point back in the green. God healed my wife of stage three colon cancer by having hands laid on her and praying in the name of almighty the name of almighty Jesus mm -hmm. healed my wife of stage three B cancer. That praise is God. Just, praise God. It's right. What, what a miracle. What the a miracle. miracle we could have ever asked for in our entire life was granted by God. So anybody out there, please believe that these healings take place today. You just have to ask and believe. Guys, you got to believe it in your heart. I must have been like a little kid believing that God would heal because we are at a wit's end. When you get when you get a cancer diagnosis in the family, it's devastating. I must have just believed. And she must have just believed. And the pastor believed. And the God Almighty Jesus in the flesh healed my wife of stage 3B cancer. Praise God. The scan also came back, Julie. The scan came back. Remember when it goes 3B, it's in a lymph node. The okay. scan came back. It did not metastasize anywhere. We had the scan, no metastasis. God is healed so good. completely, 100% healed of cancer. Mm. Well, you guys have th some things to do. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are, you and your wife are, what a beautiful story. What a beautiful testimony. And again, I love how authentic you are. I love the metamorphosis that you went through what he's done and what seven months has just been a miracle. And I know you have a few more things, a few more things that happened to you. And so what I want to tell our viewers is to go to your new YouTube channel because you're going to share some more things, some more miracles that happened to you there. So again, Keith, you are an amazing person and I'm so blessed by your testimony. And just thank you again for sharing, sharing today. Anybody can experience the love of God. You just have to turn from uh, the life that you're living now. Uh, if you know it's not the life you should be living, 
And you must repent, uh, honestly repent. Um, you have to repent for your sins. Uh, get on your knees, man, in your room. Get a box of tissues next to you and just cry out to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness. Tell him you're sorry. Ask him for forgiveness. And you know what? He will grant it because he is good and he's only good. And no matter how dark your life is, there's people with darker lives out there than I was living. But I can tell you this. I know for a fact that he can forgive you no matter what. And then transform your life through him. Live as he lived on this planet. And guys, once you trans start transforming your life, and it won't be done consciously, it will just start happening. Mm. Accept him as Lord and Savior into your life and watch what happens. He will change you. Like I said, I suffered from social anxiety for most of my life. Um, God took that out of me that night. I no longer have social anxiety disorder. No, it's completely gone. I gave this testimony for the first time in public to my church. Guys, people with social anxiety cannot get up in front of a church and give a testimony, let alone speak into a microphone. Yeah. So that's all gone also. That's another he did it. I didn't do it. No yeah. psychologist, no, no medication. He did it. He pulled it off from me. Praise God. Glory to God. Why don't you lead us out in a prayer today? Sure. Sounds good. Okay. Oh, Father God, we come to you today in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity uh, to give my testimony today. And also, please, Father God, in the name of Jesus, continue to bless Julie and her family and bless her YouTube ministry here. It's doing many, many good things for many, many good people. I ask that you bless her ministry in the mighty name of Jesus. Continue to pour your power out through her and let her speak to the world and give these testimonies because they are helping many, many people. Father God, I also ask in the name of Jesus that you pull all the people out of the darkness and bring them into your light. Bring them into your caring, loving light and let them flourish in this world to bring your kingdom here so we can provide everything that we need to all these people through all the different ministries that you've anointed. Thank you, Father God, for everything. Thank, we thank you for everything, everything you have done for us. We thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' precious, precious name, and by the blood of Jesus, amen. Amen.